Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, like Dr. Greenberg said, I'm Lindsay, and I'm currently a neurology resident, and I'm planning on doing neuroimmunology when I'm done. And so today I'll be talking about the research I did as a medical student with 4AP and optic neuritis. So this is just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. And for the sake of time, I'm not really going to go through it. But basically, I'll just be talking about a broad overview of neuroimmunologic diseases and then going into optic neuritis, how we diagnose and test optic neuritis. I'll talk about 4-aminopyridine for those of you who aren't familiar with the medication. And then I'll talk specifically about our study and what we found and what our future directions are. So as many of you may know or may have experienced, there are a lot of common symptoms with neuroimmunologic disorders. A lot of you may have had numbness or tingling. Um, some of you may have had weakness or trouble with walking. And some of you may have had vision difficulties from optic neuritis. And while these are all different symptoms and some of you have them more severe than others or maybe not at all, um, there is one common factor in that they're all due to immune damage to the nervous system. And even though the symptoms are very different, it really just depends on where the immune attack is on what symptoms you have. And so that's kind of unique and interesting, and it makes research um, useful in the sense that we can look at one aspect of the nervous system, and that might tell us what's going on in another area as well. Um, and so in our study, we were researching optic neuritis, but if you don't have vision trouble, it still could be applicable to your symptoms because it the studies we did can tell us about nerve damage in the rest of the body as well. And so when you have a neuroimmunologic disorder, the immune system generally attacks the nervous system in two different ways to cause trouble with conduction. So some of you may be familiar with these terms, and I'll just describe them more basic for those of you who are not. There are two types of damage that interfere with nervous conduction in these disorders. You can have demyelination, and basically what that means is you have damage to the protective coating around the nerves. So you can think of the nerves in the nervous system like wires surrounded by insulation. And the nerves themselves are called axons, and the insulation is called myelin. So there, you can either damage that coating, and that will interfere with the conduction, or if you damage the actual nerves themselves, that will damage it as well. And as you would imagine, damaging the nerves would probably lead to more severe damage than just damaging the coating around the nerves. So how can we tell how much damage someone has had from their disorder, and how do we know if it's more from the myelin or more from the axons? Well, there's actually a way to study that using the visual system, and that's what makes it so unique and so interesting and why we chose to study it. The visual system has a lot of different tests that we can use in our research that tell us a lot about the structure and the function, how well the nerves are working. And like I alluded to previously, this represents disease that's going on in the rest of the nervous system as well. And our central question throughout this talk is, can we improve this function that's been done with the damage that's been done to our nerves? Um, we might not be able to actually fix the damage to the nerves themselves, but is there a way to improve function? So keep that in mind as I continue through the talk. And so these are just representing what I was talking about. So this is a picture of what demyelination might look like. So over there on the left, um, so you have the myelin here, and then the signal is traveling pretty quickly because this insulation is helping it travel. However, in the middle, you have damage to this protective coating, and so the signal is having more difficulty getting through. So you would imagine that that would lead to various symptoms. However, you could also have axonal damage, which is just completely damaging the entire nerve itself. So this would be more severe because the signal would not be able to get through at all. Now, talking a little bit more in detail about optic neuritis, since that was the focus of my research. So optic neuritis, as you may know, is a frequent symptom in lots of neuroimmunologic disorders, most commonly in multiple sclerosis and neuromyelitis optica. And it's often the first presenting symptom in patients with neuromyelitis optica. Now, the common changes that most people see when they have an acute episode of optic neuritis might be difficulty seeing colors. Some people might have blurriness of vision, which we call impaired visual acuity. Um, some people will have pain with eye movement, which is a very common symptom when you have an attack of optic neuritis. 
Optic neuritis usually affects one eye at first, but it can progress to affect both eyes. And so after an acute event of optic neuritis, a lot of the, or no. So this slide represents what one might see with optic neuritis. I promise your vision's okay. That picture on the left is meant to look blurry. So the picture on the right is meant to represent normal vision. And then the picture on the left is meant to represent what someone might see after an event of optic neuritis. So it's much more blurry and the person might have impaired visual acuity, but this is more when they have the attack itself. However, after a few months, maybe six months down the line, a lot of vision with optic neuritis does seem to improve. The deficits I was just referring to with the impaired acuity and color vision and things like that might get better. And so you might wonder, well, why are we talking about this? Why are we putting so much research in this? Well, a lot of people still do report impaired difficulties with more subtle things that you might not think of at first. After months down the line, people still have trouble with night vision. So they might say they're having trouble driving because they can't see well at night. And that's because they have difficulty with contrast vision. So they have difficulty with the black and white and seeing more contrast at night. People might also have difficulty detecting edges. And you might see that in someone who says they have trouble walking down the stairs. You might also see that someone has trouble detecting motion, and that could interfere with driving, as you would imagine, and various things that would require that. So while these subtle difficulties probably aren't as prominent and people don't complain of them as much, it would still be useful if we could help um, repair that function and improve it. So as well, even though the symptoms might recover for the most part, some of you may know of UTOF's phenomenon whenever you have um, in times of stress or illness or fatigue, the symptoms might worsen. And so it would be beneficial if we could reduce some of that as well. Now, how does your physician know that you've had optic neuritis whenever you go see them in clinic? A lot of that is from what you tell them, and a lot of the diagnosis is based off of clinical history. However, there's also lots of testing that we can do in order to diagnose optic neuritis. We can, I broke it down into structure and functions, and that's kind of the central theme of my talk. And in order to look at the actual structure of the optic nerve itself, you can have your doctor, you, I'm sure most of you have this done where they shine the bright light in the back of your eye, they're really uncomfortably close, you see spots for a while. Um, when they're doing that, they're basically trying to look at the optic disc to see if it's pale, and that tells us if you may have had optic neuritis in the past. We also have a tool called optical coherence tomography, and I'll call it OCT from now on. And that, I'm going to describe in much more detail, but that also tells us very much about the structure of the optic nerve. We can also test function, um, and that just tells us how well someone is seeing and how well the visual system is working. So we can do that by testing visual acuity, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, or we can look at visual evoked potentials, which actually tells us how fast the optic nerve is working, how fast the signals are traveling. So how do we measure visual acuity in someone who's had optic neuritis? Well, in order to, for us to determine how well you can see, we can use this chart, which I'm sure most of you have seen in clinic, where you read the black letters on the white background. And it has been shown that after optic neuritis, patients usually aren't impaired in looking at this chart. So you might be able to see as many letters as someone without an event of optic neuritis on this chart here. However, researchers have come up with a different type of chart to look at the deficits that people with optic neuritis might have. And so this one is called low contrast visual acuity. And as you can tell, it's really hard to see. Um, I, there are letters up there. And this is called a low contrast visual acuity chart. It's basically gray, light gray letters on a white background. And that tells us much more about contrast vision. And patients with optic neuritis will commonly have impaired vision on this chart on the right, even if they're able to see normally on the chart on the left. Now, I was talking about the exam, the fundoscopic exam of the optic disc. And so this is what your physician might see in the back of your eye. That just represents the optic disc. And they're trying to determine if it's pale or not. <clears throat> this is a cartoon representation if you were to take a cross section of the optic nerve to determine um, so we want to see, in this picture, we're most, mostly going to focus on this part of it. 
We, can, we don't have to worry about the other layers. There's lots of different layers in the retina. But for our purposes, we can just focus on the ganglion nerves and the optic nerve. So what's really unique about the visual system and what really helped in our study design um, is that these nerves here, before they turn into the optic nerve, actually did not have myelin on them. So they're purely just the wires, just the axons. And so that's really cool because that allows us to just see if someone has damage to their axons or damage to their wires. And that just tells us about the structure and we can separate that completely from the myelin component. And then once it becomes the optic nerve, it becomes myelinated. Now, we can't really tell too much by just looking in the back of the eye because we can see if it's pale, but that doesn't tell us exactly how much damage to the wires have been done. So we have a test called OCT, and this is the patient here who sits. It's a very simple test. It takes a few minutes. It's non-invasive, um, and the physician or whoever's doing the test sits here with this little joystick. It's kind of like a video game. Um, they move it around, and then it puts out this image here. And <coughs> So that gives us what's called the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is just those unmyelinated axons of the ganglion nerves. So if we have thinning of that, which this OCT can tell us if how thick that is down to a micron level, so a single cell level, it can tell us that there's been thinning to the um, axon in the RNFL. And like I said, it's an easy test. Anyone who's been trained it's easily reproducible after someone has been trained to do it. Now this is the cartoon I showed earlier, and then this is what you might see on OCT. And so as you can see, there's very fine detail, and it tells us a lot about um, the thickness of these layers in the retina, specifically this top one here, which is the retinal nerve fiber layer. This is the exact output that we would see on OCT. This image here is meant, so this is the optic disc, this is the layers of the retina, and then this here has a bunch of numbers and it basically averages out to tell us how thick the retinal nerve fiber layer is. So this is meant to represent a normal one. It's color-coded, so green means normal. Um, this one is 87 microns, which above 80 is considered normal. So this person likely has not had any optic neuritis. However, this one, as you can see, is red, and red means very severe damage. Their average RNFL thickness is 45 microns, and so anything less than 60 is usually considered pretty severe. Um, so somewhere in the range of 60 to 80 microns is considered mild damage to the optic nerve. But as you can see, it, just, it tells us down very specifically how much damage has been done. So that's really cool that we can tell that specifically how much structural damage has been done in the optic nerve. Now, kind of tying back the things I've already talked about together, we have this high contrast and low contrast visual acuity chart, and Laura Balser, who was at Penn, um, now NYU, showed that for every um, level of vision loss on this low contrast chart, you actually have four microns of thinning of your retinal nerve fiber layer. So that just shows that um, the OCT very accurately predicts how much um, someone can see based off of how much damage they've been done. So those two tests are very correlated. Now, we've talked a lot about the structure of the optic nerve, but how do we know if someone has had myelin damage? Well, we do a test called visual evoked potentials. And this is more of a functional test. This tells us how well the optic nerve and how well the visual system is functioning. So this is kind of what the setup looks like. And so we have the person here, the patient, who's getting the test. They have the three electrodes on their head, and we have this visual stimulus here. They look at this red dot in the center, and it has a checkerboard pattern. The checkerboards, when we start the test, will move back and forth. When that starts happening, that sends a signal through their eyes, to their retina, through the optic nerve, to the brain. Those electrodes are measuring how fast that signal is traveling, and then it's putting it out here on the computer monitor. And this is an easier depiction of what we expect to see when we do visual evoke potentials. And we have three peaks in this waveform that are always there, but the one that we can be concerned about is called the P100. And the P100 is the, usually the tallest peak in the waveform, and it's called the P100 because it's 
if no one has had damage to the optic nerve, if they have normal vision, then you expect to see that peak at exactly 100 milliseconds with some individual variation. However, if someone has had myelin damage and their nerve signals aren't traveling as fast, you would expect that signal to travel slower. So you would expect what we call a delayed P100 latency. So that signal takes longer for it to peak. And this image just represents what I was saying. So this is a right eye and this is a left eye on visual evoke potentials. Now this one is considered normal. It peaks at 100 milliseconds. But this one is considered abnormal because it takes longer to get to the P100. So that has a delayed P100 latency. And so we can assume that this person has had optic neuritis primarily with myelin damage in their left eye. So they have more impaired function. Now, just bringing back before I go on everything I've talked about to tie it together. So we're primarily concerned with vision, which we can test using our visual acuity charts with high contrast and low contrast visual acuity. And our vision is composed of myelin and axons. So the function, how fast everything's moving on the visual book potentials, and the axons, so the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, how intact our structure is. Now, is there a way, if we can't improve that damage that's been done, is there something we can do to restore function after vision has been lost? Well, there's actually a really neat medication that some of you may have heard of called 4-aminopyridine. And before I describe how it works, I'll describe a little bit more about what happens when you have myelin damage. So here, this is a normal nerve with intact myelin. And what the myelin does is it covers what's called potassium channels. And so when those are covered, the signal is traveling along rapidly as it should. However, when the myelin is damaged, you have those channels are exposed and the potassium is leaking out and therefore that makes it more difficult for the signal to travel. Now, you can imagine that if we could block those channels with something, that could kind of function as myelin and help our signal travel more quickly. So we, that's exactly what a for aminopyridine does. So it's a really simple medication, but it actually is very useful. So it blocks those channels, and it, we have functional recovery, and our signal travels quickly again, even though we're not actually repairing any damage. Now, you might say, okay, well, that's great, but what are the side effects? Well, we have a lot of um, common side effects like dizziness, headache, and things like that, and then very rarely, formenopyridine is associated with seizures. However, in our study, we did not see any serious adverse events related to the medication, and we concluded as long as it's taken um, as prescribed, we expect it to be a safe medication. Now, some of you have more likely heard of Ampira or dalfamperidine. This is the same thing as formenopyridine. It works the same way, but it just lasts longer, it's a sustained release form. And so that basically means you have to take it less often because it lasts longer in the body. This um, Ampira has been studied in MS patients. Very recently they did a study to see if it improved the speed of walking in these patients um, by doing what's called a 25 foot timed walk test. So they timed these patients how long it took them to walk 25 feet and then after they got the medication they did it again to see if they were walking any faster. And interestingly, and kind of what you would expect based off of what we know so far, they saw people that they called responders and people that they called non-responders. And essentially what that means is that while it seems kind of intuitive, some people respond to medication and some people don't. And the reason that they think that is and why we think that is in our study as well is that the people that have had too much structural damage, too much damage to their wires or to their axons, would not really expect a benefit from this medication. However, if you're someone that's had primarily damage just to the myelin, you would expect to see more of a benefit. And so that's really cool that they kind of pointed that out, that they only have some responders. But those that do respond really do respond well to the medication. And like I said, so that would be more of those people with myelin damage, but not so much in the people with more severe damage to their nerves. Well, is there a way for us to know if you're going to benefit from this medication? Um, without you having to take it and see if you're a responder or not. Well, that was actually one of the goals of our study, which I'll get to in a little bit, but keep that in the back of your mind. Now, just to go over very quickly study design before I get into our study, um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with clinical trials. Um, so the placebo effect basically means that 
If someone takes a sugar pill or a placebo, there is an effect just by virtue of taking the medication where someone feels like they may improve. And we use that in studies as a control group to get rid of that possible variability in the study to compare to our study drug. Now, normally in studies, you have control groups and you have drug groups, and those are two separate groups. Some people take the placebo and others take the drug. However, there's a different type of study that's not used as commonly, but it's more unique in the sense that you don't have to have as many patients. And what that's called is a crossover study. And so everybody in the study gets assigned to the drug at one point in time, and they take that for an interval, and then they take the placebo for a certain interval. And so that's cool because you, you can, everybody gets to experience the medication at some point, and you can compare each person's um, test results while they're on the medication and while they're on the placebo. And then double-blind studies, which is how ours was run, basically means that we don't know, nor do the subjects know, when they're on the medication and when they're on the placebo. And how that works is we have pill bottles with unique codes on them. We have the codes sealed away in an envelope, so we don't know during the study what anyone is on, and they don't know. We like to guess and make bets during the study, but we can't find out until the study is over. Now, getting into our study, so our goal primarily was to see if this medication for aminopyridine could restore vision in someone who'd had optic neuritis. And we also, like I was kind of alluding to a few minutes ago, we wanted to see if we could determine who these responders would be prior to them taking the medication. So can we determine if someone will benefit from this medication just based on what we know with our testing. And that's what we were thinking with our OCT, because if we can see, based on OCT, that you've had really bad damage to your nerves, we wouldn't expect you to benefit from this medication necessarily. So that was our secondary goal. For our study, we recruited 22 patients, and we determined they'd had a prior event of optic neuritis, um, and we did that using OCT. So we recruited those people to participate in our study. We defined an event of optic neuritis by having at least one eye less than 80 microns in RNFL thickness. Then, like I was saying, our study was double-blind, placebo-controlled, and crossover. So everyone got the medication at some point. Everyone got the placebo. We had them come in three times. They came in and had baseline testing to see how their vision was prior to taking anything. Then some people were randomly assigned to take five weeks of drugs. Some people got placebo first. Everyone came back in at five weeks. They had repeat testing to see if anything changed. Then they crossed over and took whatever they hadn't been taking previously. And now this is just a more visual representation of how a crossover design works. So you have this group that starts on the placebo, randomly assigned. This group that starts on the drug, randomly assigned. They take it for five weeks. They come back then this group starts to take the drug for five weeks, this group starts to take the placebo. And then it was a 10-week total study. Now, our two things that we were primarily measuring in our study were visual acuity, and we had to decide, well, how can we determine if they've actually had a meaningful improvement? What would be a significant improvement in visual acuity? So based on previous studies, we decided to define a responder as someone who had an improvement of at least five letters on low contrast visual acuity. So that would be at least one line of improvement on the vision chart. And now we were also trying to determine if the conduction speed on visual evoke potentials would move faster. So did the P100 latency get shorter? Was that signal moving faster after they got formulopyridine? Which you would expect, right? Because it's, it's acting as myelin and making it move faster. And so our results, we did find, so first of all, with visual acuity, we did have a higher percentage of subjects who were responders who could see at least five more letters on the visual acuity charts while they were taking the 4-AP compared to taking the placebo. This is consistent with the Ampira studies and the timed walk tests where they had responders and non-responders. Interestingly, and also very exciting, we did see in the P100 latency um, a statistically significant difference between the placebo and the 4-aminopyridine. Um, those people on the 4 amino pyridine did have a faster P100 latency, faster P100. So it was making the signal travel faster in their optic nerve. Now, like I already said before, we didn't have any serious adverse events with our study, and so we believe it to be safe if taken correctly. And then, 
so after we found those results, we wanted to see if there was um, some sort of result if we separated the groups by their retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. So what we did is we divided it up based on if they, this would be normal, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, this is mild damage to the axons, and then this is very severe damage. We would expect, based off of what we know, for these people here that don't have very much severe damage to benefit mostly from the 4AP. So we grouped our results by the people, um, by their retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. When we analyzed it in this group, in the 60 to 80 micron group, we actually found an even more significant improvement in the P100 latency compared to just looking at the entire group. So that was really exciting because that means that we could potentially do OCT, look at someone's retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. If you're in this range, then we can say, well, you might benefit from this medication. And that would save people time from trying it if we don't think there's really going to be a benefit. So in conclusion, our results were consistent with what they saw with the Ampira studies, that there is a subset of responders that improve and there are people that do not respond, and it's just based on what type of damage you have and how much damage has been done, and that's what we expected. And so essentially, in summary, we, have, we do have functional recovery. It is possible to have functional recovery without actually repairing any damage that's been done. And then based on that last slide with the 60 to 80 cohort group, we can use someone's OCT profile to predict if someone might benefit from the medication. In addition, we can also use the OCT to tell us, like I was talking about in the beginning, if they have a lot of structural damage based off of OCT, we would expect them not to benefit in other symptoms as well. However, if we can tell based on OCT and VEP that someone has had mostly demyelinating damage, we might say, well, you might also see an improvement in your walking or your numbness or another various symptom that you're having. And like I said, in summary, we concluded that formulopyridine improves vision in patients with primarily demyelinating optic neuritis. The future directions where we would like to see this go from here, we would like to do this in a larger group of patients because we did have a fairly small group. We had 22 patients. We would expect to see more of a significant effect if we had a bigger group. And then it would be really interesting to limit the group to those people with just RNFLs that we would expect to benefit from the medication and we would expect to see more of a, an effect that way. And then I just want to acknowledge everyone who helped me out for the year. I would not have been able to do this without them. Um, Amy and Daryl Conger are the neuro-ophthalmology imag imaging specialists, and they taught me everything I know, how to use all the imaging tests and the visual tests. Dr. Greenberg, who helped me throughout the way, who was very supportive, who taught me all about clinical trials, how to run them, and helped me with the paper and everything else. He was amazing. Um, Dr. Froman, who also helped immensely, his wife, Teresa Froman, and Gina Remington, who helped me. She's a clinical research coordinator and helped with the trial design and the blinding and everything like that. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.